how do we rewrite this narrative? And there's something you talk about very early on, just a couple of years ago, when we were making the film. There's a scene in the film where you're talking and stuff. It's all slow mo when there's nice music and people are nodding their heads and you know and so forth. Good, good editing, um, Loki. Yes. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, it's a really beautiful moment. I love the music in there. Uh, but the four forces and counter forces of privilege. Yeah. Welcome to part two of our discussion on white privilege with Curtis Linton. This is Loki Mulholland, and it's time to get uncomfortable. As as I've been going through this experience, and you know, if, if people see a photo of me, they'll see that I have this this white lock. So I have a white lock of hair on my forehead, and it is so common that I forget that it's there. I was. It's born. a birthmark, isn't it? It's a birthmark. Yeah. Okay. And actually inherited it from my father. So there's a little story behind it. So I actually call this, um, you know, the the white lock framework, you know, for my own personal reasons. But but my parents, when I was growing up, would always say that I was kissed by an angel there. I was somehow special. And so, you know, it was about a year and a half ago when I, I was trying to figure out how do I label this this framework, you know, of privilege. And it hit me, white lock. It always made me feel special. It always made me feel special. So, it's the, you know, it's the, it's the white lock framework. And so... What we move through as we go through this framework is four forces of privilege and four counter forces of privilege. And so in everything I've been describing in my relationship with my kids, learning how to be you know, more present for them, but especially allowing them to be present within themselves, I've realized that I have to rewrite my own narrative. Because if my whole life has been privileged, you know, as a white person in society, then that privilege has impacted the narrative that I tell about myself. But our own narratives are so deeply ingrained that it requires a high degree of conscious to start picking it apart. And so the first piece of this is understanding the forces of privilege. And so there's four forces of privilege, subconscious, monoculturalism, individualism, and primacy. Uh, there's a lot of discussion we can have moving through each of these that, you know, that's, that's worthy conversation. But so the first piece is that privilege is subconscious. I'm not required to think about this in a conscious way every day. It's just the way the world works. Mm. The second force is monoculturalism, which is the reality is most of my life, even if I, you know, if I take into consideration my quote unquote diverse and ethnic experiences, has been monocultural. Mm-hmm. I was raised surrounded by people who look like me, sounded like me, believe like me, etc. And, and even if you live in a very diverse city, the, you know, we live in Utah, but if you lived, you know, in a very diverse city, you could still have a very monocultural experience. Exactly, because we tend to interact most with those who are like us. And so if I have not critically examined this, then I assume most people think like me. I mean, this is, it's, it's a, it's a small comparison, but yeah, you know, it's my conservative cousins, um, small town, Utah, who are like, I don't know anyone who, you know, supports Obama or what, you know, no, they don't because they live in a monocultural <laughs> experience. That's a, that's a very honest statement. Of course you don't. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a force of privilege, right? If everyone I know thinks like me, then the way I think must be the way people should think. That's why it's a force of privilege, monoculturalism, individualism is the next force. And so I weigh everything through an individual lens. This is the centering just in on my own experience. And so, so you got to start thinking about how these things play together. So they reinforce one another. So if I am individually centered, I tend to think about, you know, the world just through my own experience. Mm-hmm. Well, that's reinforced being in a monocultural place. Right. Right. Because I don't see a lot of diversity in thought and in experience around me. But then all that is reinforced by subconscious. So it's hard for individualism to be a strong force of privilege if it is not undergirded by the other forces of subconscious and monoculturalism. Mm. It's harder to be an individual who's highly conscious of difference in a multicultural place. So they reinforce each other. Mm -hmm. But all these build up really to the fourth force of privilege, which is primacy. And primacy is a, is a tough, you know, kind of nut to crack. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And I've seen a lot of people go through this exploration of what is primacy. And when they finally understand how primacy is a force of privilege, all the rest of this makes sense. And so, and we've been talking about this throughout this entire discussion. So, you know, think primacy shares a root with primary, primary being first. Primacy is this assumption that the way I've lived the world is just the best way to live it. And so an example that I use with this is, you know, is, is think about two elementary school teachers, you know, two white female teachers, they teach second grade. They're in, you know, the teacher break room and they're talking about Johnny. Mm -hmm. And Johnny has two moms and they love Johnny's moms. And they are very proud to tell people, oh, yes, Johnny in my class, he has two moms. Mm -hmm. They're all into gay marriage, 100% fully support it. They support Johnny's moms to no end and they love Johnny to no end. Mm -hmm. But Johnny's struggling. He's acting up sometimes. So these two teachers, both who love Johnny's moms and they love Johnny too, are sitting in the break room talking with one another about Johnny's struggles. And one of them goes, you know what Johnny needs? Johnny just needs. What's your response? Oh, well, he needs a positive you know, male role model. He needs a dad or whatever. Precisely. Yeah. That's primacy. I love Johnny's moms. I support the fact they're married. From all intents and purposes and outward communication, I am behind them 100%. But I've raised my children with the father in the house. So if Johnny's acting up, because Johnny does not have the way I've lived the world, that must explain why he's struggling right now. Mm -hmm. That's primacy. 100% support and 100% judgment at exactly the same moment. Mm. That's primacy. And so the real challenge with this is this, this goes right to the heart and core of progressive politics and liberalism and everything else. I mean, you don't see many activists out there promoting that the world should be as someone else lives it. Mm -hmm. No, a liberal progressive activist gets out there and says, I know exactly how the world should be, and I'm going to tell you. Right. It should be the way I think it should be. And so, but with primacy, primacy unlocks an understanding of privilege, in my mind, better than anything else. Because it describes how centered the privilege experience is. Mm. Absolutely centered. And so you think about how all these forces work together and in... And if I don't like this, I mean, let's face it. This is not a fun conversation for me to lead with other people, you know, particularly white people. It is far easier for me to sit down with people and say, oh, my gosh, this is the experience of color. And did you know about the history of race in the U.S.? And it's so disgusting. Let's right. get passionate about it. Let's go fight against it. That's a fun conversation to have. When I'm sitting down with someone, someone who wants to go fight to end racism and I take them to the point of primacy and mm -hmm. force them to re-examine all their values and how they inflict them on people, that's not a very fun conversation. They don't like it. And the fascinating thing with this is that of all the things I've worked on over the years, it is harder for me to get people to engage in this workshop than anyone I've ever done. Mm. Because it's really uncomfortable. It doesn't make me feel good within my own sense of progressivism and activism. So to challenge privilege, so we use these four forces, subconscious, monoculturalism, individualism, and primacy. Well, we have to apply direct counter forces to each of these. So the reason why we talk about rewriting one's narrative is that I have to rewrite my life's story, all my values through the counter forces rather than the forces of privilege. My work has taken me to a lot of places and I've been fortunate to meet some incredible people. But when I came to Selma and met Joanne Blackman Bland, I knew I was in the presence of greatness. Joanne was 11 years old when she was attacked on the Edmund Pettus Bridge on Bloody Sunday in 1965. She wasn't old enough to vote, but understood its importance enough to be there. After Selma is an in-depth look at how our right to vote has eroded since the signing of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, the fight for the right to vote continues. Get informed. 
you can find After Selma on Amazon Prime or visit LokiMulholland.com to purchase a copy for your collection. And, and understanding on this for a moment here, though, is when you're talking about rewriting your narrative and stuff, this is not to say that the life you lived is wrong. It just it's, it's just that, look, there are other lives that were lived. Right. I mean, this, this is why that 1619 project is so fascinating, because it tells the same story of the founding of America that we all grew up listening to, mm-hmm. just through the perspective of Black people. That's it. Right. And so, so it doesn't claim that Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation in a different year than he did. No, the facts remain the same. But it's the perspective which is shifted. Mm. The narrative is rewritten. And hence, there's a, you know, a bevy of knowledge and understanding to gain when we shift our narrative. You know, when we inclusivize, to make up a word, when we inclusivize our narrative, there's so much to learn. Right. And so, again, I'm going to talk about my own experience. I don't actually, believe it or not, I have not been black and I have not lived black. And so I cannot share this experience through what it might mean to be black. Mm -hmm. But I have been white and I have lived white. And so I can share my own experience of being a white person in today's society as an example of going through this. Right. So when I graduated high school, um, you know, I was one of the top performers in my class. I um, got a full ride scholarship to the University of Utah. It was the presidential scholarship. It was the biggest scholarship given in the state at the time. Mm-hmm. I gave a graduation speech. You know, I give a graduation speech. I stand up there, have this big scholarship. People applaud me. It feels really good, right? I mean, man, I pulled off high school well. So how did I do that? Well, I worked hard. I, you know, X, Y, and Z as to the things that led up to me getting this presidential presidential scholarship. I started on the football team. I had the lead in the school play. I was a student body officer. You know, I had a high ACT score. Just go down the list. I've accomplished all of these things. So that's my story coming into it, right? Mm -hmm. That's my privileged story. Subconscious, monocultural, individual primacy all wrapped up within that. I need to rewrite that narrative. You know, for me, this is personal because I have two kids going through school, having a night and day different experience, hundred percent different experience. Actually don't use night and day. It's, it's a phrase I'm trying to change because it suggests, you know, dark versus light. Mm -hmm. So, so as a father, I have two kids who are coming up through school with a hundred percent different experience. And if I use my privilege to judge their academic efforts, we will be in total conflict, 100% conflict. But they're coming into this world entirely different than what I went through. And so I have to rewrite my educational narrative in order that I might allow my kids to be present within their own educational experience. So how do I do this? Well, the four counterforces, so if the four forces of privilege are subconscious, monocultural, individual, and primacy, the four counterforces are knowledge, diversity, collectivism, and empathy. So if I think about my educational experience, well, first off, I have to challenge the subconscious nature of it. The reality was that I was treated beyond what I deserved at that school from day one. Subconsciously, I knew it. My parents both worked for the school district. My siblings have been student body officers, um, you know, top, top of their class, all the rest. So when I walked into that school, there was only one assumption, and it was that I was going to succeed. So ra- now think about that. It was that I was going to succeed, not that I was going to attain my own success. There's only one option for the school. It was that I succeed. Now, that's a hard thing to acknowledge because. I like to think of myself as rather intelligent. Yeah. And so this is where my subconscious gets challenged by knowledge. My subconscious was, I'm really successful as a student. The knowledge is I was set up for success. Right. Okay, so that's the first piece. I've now applied a counterforce of knowledge to the force of subconscious. Mm -hmm. Monoculturalism versus diversity. 
I, monoculture, my monocultural experience in my high school was intense. I shared the same racial identity, religious identity, um, socioeconomic class, political affiliation as 90 plus percent of my teachers, probably 95 percent. Mm -hmm. So I never felt as though I was very different from them. And so if I'm honest about the lack of diversity, so this is so if I take diversity as a lens and place it on monocultural, diversity as a counterforce, place it on the force of monoculturalism, then I have to acknowledge that I was never challenged by difference nor diversity. I could just kind of play on the edge with a little bit of liberal politics and feel as though I was highly diverse. Right but take full advantage of the 95% of, the, of our traits that were exactly the same. And so think about this as well. It's like I was valuing my, my one little tidbit of difference way out over here and subconsciously living off of all of our monocultural similarities. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm rewriting it, the reality is that my success in high school did not come from me showing up not fitting in and figuring out how to fit in, that my success was due to the fact that I was the same as all of them. Right. There was a fundamental lack of diversity. So now as I think about bringing diversity into this story as a counterforce to monoculturalism, I have to value the diverse experiences of people's education equal to my own, which means someone who is failing out of most of their classes has an equally valid education to mine where I was getting straight A's and 4.0s. Right. I have to acknowledge that diversity within the experience. You know, it's the only way I'll ever get to some deeper sense of understanding. So now moving on to the third force of privilege, which is individualism. I alone received that scholarship. I alone was the beneficiary. Right. Well, if I apply a counterforce of collectivism to it, oh, no, the whole community wanted me to pull this off. No one was going to let me fail. Now, this is real challenge because then I have to acknowledge that I was not a worthy recipient of that scholarship. I was the beneficiary, but not the worthy recipient. So I didn't pull this off on my own. No, I mean, I was forging my dad's signature to get me excused from class. I had every teacher convinced that I was working so hard as a student body officer that when I skipped class, they would assume I was doing something for the school. Reality is I was out in the parking lot making out. All right. But that judgment <laughs> never hit me. Right. They thought I was doing something for the benefit of the school, and I took full advantage of it every right. time. Right. That's really hard to acknowledge because I am delegitimizing my whole identity. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is this is professional political suicide, right? Right, but we'll go to the end of the earth to uh, to prop up the facade. Exactly. I mean, imagine I'm allowing you to record this right now. Let's say I run for office someday, and this surfaces, and someone is out there saying huh, Curtis Linton's a fraud, and he even admits it. You know, but but I cannot get to an understanding of privilege unless I acknowledge the collective impact on my life. Right. And so I have to acknowledge all these other forces at play. I was never harassed by the police. I was never, you know, um, I was never pushed into special ed because that's just where people like me go. I believed I was individually superior, but I was just taking a collective benefit. Right. So, which then moves us to this fourth, you know, force and counterforce of privilege. So, all this story that I've talked about my own education and rewriting my narrative. Mm -hmm. Now, the reality is, I was a really good student. That's not a joke. You know, I like school. It's why I've gotten multiple degrees. I like that academic educational setting. And I like working through problems. I like intellectual discussion. That is all me. And that is natural. Mm -hmm. But so when we come to this fourth piece of primacy, so I had my educational experience. Now I'm raising two kids very different from myself, you know, racially and heritage and background and everything else. And they're going through school 
in such a different way than I ever went through it. And so if I allow the force of privilege, of primacy, to guide my judgments of their academic experience, then I'm going to say, well, did you work hard enough? Did you thank the teacher as you leave the class? Did you play the politics well enough? Because, man, I knew how to play the politics of school. So I'm going to again and again and again make sure my kids know that they're deficient because they are not going through school the way I went through it. So the counterforce to primacy is empathy. And so if I approach my kids through primacy, they will come to believe I do not get them. I don't understand their lives, their lived experience. So I have to consciously remember how all these build up, right? I have to turn back to understanding a collective experience. They're in a school system where white kids are twice as likely to graduate than black kids. That is their statistical reality. That's a collective reality. Okay, I have to think about diversity here. The student body at their schools are very diverse. The teachers are not. The teachers are monocultural. In my other life, I'm a filmmaker, and one of my more fascinating films I created is the award-winning film titled Black, White, and Us. It's about viewing racism through the lens of transracial adoptions in Utah. Utah? Yeah, Utah. It just so happens to be the transracial adoption capital of the world. So what happens when white families who didn't believe racism existed anymore adopts a black child? Find it on Amazon Prime or visit LokiMalholland.com to purchase a copy for your collection. But then the layer of excuses that would come with that. Yes. Um, you know, well, what, what, what's their home life like? What's this? What's that? What's this? Without any reflection about what actually the school system is like. And almost the teachers to a T will say, oh, I chose to teach in this diverse setting. So they're choosing to teach in these very diverse schools, but they're monocultural in their collective. Right. And so then knowledge versus subconscious. If I am trying to understand my kids' lived experience, mm -hmm. I have to consciously research it. I have to surface knowledge of their reality, even if they, if they may not want to share it with me. You know, kids don't always want to share everything with their parents. That's a normal thing. But I have to surface that so that I am, as I am interacting with my children and their educational experience, I'm coming from a place of knowledge rather than of subconscious judgment. Mm. So all of these are at play. But this is where we take this shift from primacy into empathy. So we need to define empathy. It's it's often um, misunderstood. Um, you know, throw out a definition of empathy. How would you define empathy? No, oh, gosh, Curtis, come on. Um, you know, it, it, somebody's empathetic <laughs> is, uh, understands, is understanding. Mm -hmm. right? they're, not, they're not sympathizing from the standpoint that they feel sorry for somebody. They can understand and relate, if you will. So, so, so I'm, I'm glad you brought up sympathy. Because that's, 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 that's a nice generic, that's the one that usually most people throw out there. Yeah, which is great. Um, so, so sympathy is an attempt to feel for someone the way you think they should feel. Hey, I have sympathy for you. You know, your parent passed away. Oh, I feel for you. Oh, you should feel so sad because I would be really sad if my parent passed away. You know, so sympathy is how I feel in a situation and I am feeling how I would feel in that situation on your behalf. Mm hmm so it doesn't actually fully reflect the other person's experience. Right. They may not be sad their parent passed. Their parent may have been dealing with cancer for several years, and finally they're gone from their pain. So, so sympathy is saying, I believe I understand how you should feel at this moment, and that's what I'm going to feel, how I believe right. you should feel at this moment. Empathy is not feeling for someone because we can't feel for someone. We come from very different experiences. I mean, everything we've been talking about, I cannot mm -hmm. presume that I know what it is to be a black man in today's world. I can intellectualize it, but man, I cannot personalize it. So I cannot be empathetic for George Floyd because I've never lived that. Mm -hmm. You know, I cannot feel the same way as black males out on the street right now because that has never been my experience. Mm -hmm. That's sympathy if I was like, yeah, man, I know how, you know, 
I know how they feel. I know how you feel. That sympathy. It's mm-hmm. it's shallow. It's hollow. Right. Empathy is you have the space to feel the way you feel. Mm-hmm. I cannot determine for you how you feel. Right. If I'm exercising empathy, I give you your full range or I, you know, force myself. Let me, I need to rephrase. I mean, this is where privileges is so, is so insidious, yeah, yeah, exactly, right? Exactly. Exactly. I know I exactly what's going you, on. From my power perspective, I give you the right. right. And man, I, I, I have corrected myself at this very place dozens of times and it keeps happening. This is the insidiousness of privilege. Mm-hmm. I don't give someone else the right to feel however they may feel at the moment. I force myself to not step in. Right. You surrender your. Yeah. I hold myself back from redefining someone else's experience. Mm. Empathy as it relates to Glenn walking through Nordstrom instead of me walking through Nordstrom is that I don't rewrite Glenn's experience. Right. Oh, tell me more. I'll believe you. I'm listening. So. The slave narrative that we tell, typically in schools, is now is, is one of sympathy. Because right. the way people yes. write it, 1619 yes. Project would now be this element of empathy. Uh, uh, so well said. Okay. So well said. Okay, so, so th- think about how immediate and personal this is. So my black son, all white teachers, okay, he has struggled beyond struggled to connect in language arts. Never done well at it. I love language arts. Oh my gosh. Give me a novel. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and this is fascinating as well, right? This is recognizing diversity and collectivism. So my entire experience in language arts was in gift and talented classes where we'd r- read novels and then sit around and discuss them. That's what I thought language arts was. It wasn't until after I was graduated from high school and I was talking to the one, you know, starter on our football team who was of color, who was kind of the star of the team. And I realized he hated language arts and his experience was always diagramming sentences. I didn't know that. I would have hated language arts if it was all technical diagramming sentences, you know, um, didactic worksheets in response to something you read rather than an open conversation. So I always thought I was just particularly gifted at language arts because I love discussing books without realizing that 90% of the school was not sitting around discussing books. They were being told exactly how to think about something. So, of course, they hated it. So now, 30 years later, my son's going through language arts, and he's not connecting. He's only had white female language arts teachers. Ah, There's nothing against white female teachers. We would not have teachers if it were not for white females. Mm -hmm. They're the only ones entering the field right now. Right. And and 90% of them are fully committed and their hearts are in the right place and they're trying to do the right thing. But it's on the it's 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 in the details, in the periphery where they're losing kids. Mm. So ninth grade, they're reading um To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm-hmm. I love To Kill a Mockingbird. Oh yeah. It's one of my favorite novels. It impacted me so strongly when I was young. I even um in the play Inherit the Wind. You know, which is, um, you know, sort of like To Kill a Mockingbird. I played the role of the defense attorney who, who, you know, got to stand on stage and give this impassioned plea, you know, as as to why the the person should not be found guilty. So I have this deep connection to To Kill a Mockingbird. And I was so happy they were reading it. My son hates it. Just hates it. Mm -hmm. Can't stand it. I mean, literally... um, has such an emotional, emotionally negative reaction to it that, that he was only willing to do the absolute bare minimum to pass. <laughs> Full rejection of the book. Okay. So why might this be? Which, which is a full I, rejection of you at this point. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I had never realized this, but To Kill a Mockingbird is a white savior book. It's a white man who steps in And saves the slow-thinking black man. That's the whole book. Right. The whole story is white saviorism. It's a pantheon of our American literature. Right. I I mean, do you know how hard this was 
to acknowledge this? Oh, yeah. That my son is being forced to read a book where when he looks at himself in it, he has to depend on well-spoken white adults to save himself. Mm -hmm. It's it's, It's not even neutral. It's literally disempowering to black men. Right. But it is so empowering to me. Oh, yeah. By the, by the time we finish school, white people should feel really good about themselves. Yes. But the teacher is forcing my son to go through this. And my son's listening to the audiobook, And I'm driving with him while he's listening. Yeah. And the N-word is used. 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 So not only is he reading a book that disempowers the black man within it, he is forced to listen to a term that makes him cringe. Right. In an age of other kids coming up to him, hey, I got my impasse with you, right? I got my impasse. Of course, as a 14-year-old kid, he's like, uh, yeah, but he comes home emotionally disturbed that someone thinks they have the right to call him the N-word because they're buddies. And then he has to turn to his formal class and hear that word again and again and see that, yep, his father, you know, my son, my son's father is celebrated in this book. Yeah, that must be the way, mm. the reason why dad thinks the way he does. Right. So does my dad think on this guy? Right. That everything, all my freedom, all my joy will only come because my white dad steps in to save my life? Think how disturbing that is. I mean, so... My son was forced to go through a book that disempowers him to the core just so he could pass ninth grade. Right. And there's not inequity in this world? Bullshit. I mean, this is fundamental. Yeah. I don't need you to save me. I need you to listen to me. Yes. Right. And so if I'm at a place from sympathy with my son, first, I mean, so we talked about primacy, right? Primacy mm-hmm, is, mm-hmm. oh, you need to honor this book. Let's say I move from primacy to sympathy. Oh, she's a tough teacher. Yeah, I'm not entirely a fan of her myself. But empathy is, you know what? You choose to fail that class, I'm fully behind you. Right. You choose to reject this class, I will not step in. And isn't that tough? Because... From my entire worldview, failing a class is never an option. That is the worst thing a person could possibly right. do. Right. Oh, yeah. Because my whole forward progression, my whole life is based up, has been based upon my educational attainment. I mean, I told my kids anything less than a B is failure. Exactly. You know, that was my worldview. But I never went through a class where my teacher was presenting something fully disempowering to me. I never had that experience. Mm-hmm. So I can't claim to know what my son feels at this moment. I can't claim to share in his deep emotional rejection of this class and this teacher, but I can let him be there. I can pull myself back so that he can fully be there. Right. An Ordinary Hero was my first award winning documentary. It's about the life of my mother, Joan Trumpower Mulholland, and her participation in the civil rights movement. For most of us, our mothers are heroes because they're mothers, and mom is just mom. But when your mother's a civil rights icon, and yet you never really knew it, things change. Go check out An Ordinary Hero and find out how choosing to do what was right instead of what was easy helped change the world. You can find it on Amazon Prime, or visit LokiMulholland.com to purchase a copy for your collection. And, but then you think about not just you, but obviously his classmates and everyone else who are feeling empowered by this book and who feel that, yeah, obviously, you know, you know like again, this white savior complex is this idea that why, why would you be offended by this book? This is, look, we're doing something good. Right. Without the idea that, yes, but look at what it's saying about me. Mm-hmm. You look good in this because you're helping somebody. I didn't, I don't, but it's the assumption that that help is needed. You know, it's interesting because I'm going back on this myself going, you know, 
when I said about you know, anything less than a B is a failure, is now why does that? Why do I have that attitude? Because when my daughter said, "Hey, C's get degrees," hmm. you know, I was like, "Whoa, what?" And she's it challenged you. It wasn't oh, geez, challenging hey, her. It challenged you. C's get degrees. I'm like, no, but you know, anything less than a B is a failure. Now my kids get great grades, but I think it's probably because you know I terrorize them into that. But why do I think that? Well, because I didn't get paid by my grandma for anything less. Uh huh. Huh. Right. So if I if I got a C, guess what? I wasn't getting paid. Right. That's a failure. It wasn't an inherent value in the grade. Right. Yeah. I mean, See, I, I mean, that's a whole different system, you know, discussion. Oh, but. Okay, but but this is this is fascinating. I mean, go back through right. subconscious monoculturalism, individual individualism, and right. primacy. What, 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 no, 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 yeah. So, so so take this experience, j- just just a singular experience. This is what we talk about. This is what I talk about when I talk about black, white, and us. The film, and since you're in the film, we can talk about this for a moment. When I talk to people about it, I'm like, racism becomes personal. And that these parents have to address it, right? And that's this is what we need to be doing is make racism personal, as like the parents. And so here's this, you know, individualize it at that point, right? Uh, which is what you're doing here in regards to, to you know to kill a mockingbird, right? That all of a sudden your whole world is 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 shattered because your kid doesn't like this book and you haven't, you're not realizing this, but now you have to kind of dismantle your childhood here for a moment. Right. And go, Oh my gosh. Uh, you know, what does this mean about me? What does this mean about this? So as a nation, right. We've created this cult of America that of uh, now that it's being addressed, we're peeling back this, Hey, look, you might, th- you know what, there might be another perspective to this, uh, you know, westward expansion sounds really nice, but let's go ask the, the American Indians what they thought. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Because we see ourselves as so benevolent, uh, ourselves as America, which means white America. Right. So everything around that, now when we start to dismantle that monolithic, right, uh, and, and we start to, to uh, release that primacy and allow other viewpoints to enter in. That's when those walls come up. That's when the t- the chest tightens. That's what I talk about in the uncomfortable truth. Is that suddenly, oh my gosh! And now we double down and cling down onto this this idea that we want to hold on to, and thus, just like what we're seeing today, well, let's send troops in there, law and order, right? And all this sort of stuff comes back to what we feel the ideal has to be without any idea that there's another lived experience. But see, what you described right there, when the primacy comes up and our chest tightens, which is so well put, when when we're able to authentically shift into that empathetic space Mm -hmm. and fully value the diversity of lived experiences out there, you know what happens to that tight chest? Mm -hmm. It breathes. Right. It takes a deep breath and enjoys it. I, I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> liberation theology, right? Right. Let's talk about white liberation theology. White liberation is when whites finally can look at a situation without themselves fully centered. It's a lifetime effort. I was going to say when they arrive there, cannot arrive there. It is a lifetime effort. Mm-hmm. You know, but when I show up at that protest... And, oh, I want to get up there and start a chant as well. I want to be that person. I love (laughs) public speaking. Yes, yes. But I don't. And I sit there and I stand behind my daughter and I see how she resonates with this crowd. Mm. How she looks around and sees people like her and people not like her supporting the cause that protects her, that uplifts her. Right. And I don't force myself to be centered within this experience. I mean, think about it. If I show up, I want to be that voice and I want to center it around me and I want to tell people whether or not they should take photos and what should be chanted and whether or not we should. I mean, this is the fascinating thing. You go to these protests right now and it's like there are, you know, self-policing, right? I mean, there are people, oh, no, we should not ask the cops to kneel with us. And five feet away, 
kneel with us, kneel with us. Oh, no, we shouldn't. Kneel with us. No, we shouldn't. You know, document this, post it, share, show the world that you're here today. Don't take photos of anybody. Right. It's all white people having this argument. Right. We're all trying, you know, it's white people centering themselves within a protest, which is for somebody else. Right. It was, it was interesting. I, um, I have two points on that. One is, so I was, I had a, you know, a reporter here in Utah call, you know, message me on Facebook and said, um, Hey, is your mom available for an interview about the protests? And I said, well, she lives in Virginia. Oh, well, is there someone else that's associated with her in Utah? I said, well, yeah, you're talking to him. I said, but then I said, but you know what? Uh, might I recommend a few other people? And they were all people of color, right? Um, so it was, it, it, I mean, and for me, just like you say, I, you know, gee, I mean, yeah, I'd love to be able to get in front of the camera and pontificate a little bit. But I was like, you know what? I, I don't need to do that. That's all right. That's not a pat myself on the back. This is a realization that I don't need to be, you know, the center of it all. Um, you know what? This my, has never hit me till now, but empathy is decentering. Mm, mm, I like that. Empathy is is decentering. It's it's being at peace with the center being on someone else, on someone else's experience. Okay. Now, uh, the next experience is, as we were speaking, I was receiving, people were texting me photographs of my mother at a rally right now. And they asked her to speak. Now, I knew that she was going to be there. And, and I knew that they were going to ask her to speak because uh, she told me. But she's like, you know, uh, I have something prepared, but I, I don't really care. I don't, need to, I, don't need, I don't need to go and speak. Right. Now, the other element of that is she has a very real experience and, and brings a weight of authority with that um, because of who she is and what she went through. Yeah. Um, that they want to hear from her, yeah, me and the crowd and so forth. But she does; she doesn't need to be that, right? She has, you know, done enough, been there, done that. Doesn't need to do that. Um, but yet, you know, it's 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 interesting to think about. So yeah, it's it's she's there to show her support, and her presence is that support. But there's a there's a gosh, I mean, the complexity for her. But 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 I have to ask the question: If she was not authentically already decentered within this work, if she was not right. already authentically empathizing, I don't know if she would have lasted this long. She's going on fifty years of doing this work, and if, and if that was all six. Excuse me, sixty. If that if if she was centered within this, there's no way she would have lasted. It'd be too exhausting. Yeah. But the fact that she's decentered, that she's truly empathetic, allows her to persist because she understands the collective power of all this. She's firm within her knowledge. She's she's embracing of the diversity that is needed to pull off this work. Because it's she's not authentic. about her. Right. Even though we all love to celebrate her and we all love her and we all yeah. love to tell people that we met her. Sure. But she's not there. Right. Mm. Wow. Yeah. That was really fascinating. But I like that idea that, that decentralizing is, is, is the route to empathy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's when you're out, really your empathy is, is becomes this act of service, if you will, which is not about you. People forget that service is not about you. Want a great way to help a worthy organization and educate children about the civil rights movement? Visit our foundation, the Joan Trumpower Mulholland Foundation, at the jtmfoundation.org. That's the jtmfoundation.org. We are a 501c3 established to help end racism through education. A $5 monthly recurring donation will provide curriculum for 30 students. As my mother used to say, I can't do everything but I can do something, because doing nothing is not an option. If you have wanted to help in this cause, but didn't know how, now you can. The Joan Trump Power Mulholland Foundation at the jtmfoundation.org. 
see, see, and I have to be honest with this. I mean, you know, I told you this is the hardest workshop that I've had to get people to participate. Oh yeah. You know, um, I think when I was trying to promote this workshop, I was in a pretty struggling place with myself and I saw this, this kind of framework that I developed, you know, as my ticket. Mm -hmm. It was my way to get another book written, to get some workshops, you know, and, and I'm like, oh, there's a lot of real depth and, you know, there's, it's a really interesting way to approach it. And I've had some very positive feedback, but I kind of almost centered myself within a framework that asks you to decenter yourself. And I was like, this is what I'm going to use to launch the next part of my career. And it didn't work. Mm -hmm. Didn't work. Yeah. Because I was, <laughs> I, I wasn't taking my own medicine. <laughs> so, um, it's just really fascinating to reflect on it. And I think about your mother's work and her authentic decentering. And the thing is, is that she... As she would say, you know, you ruined a perfectly good retirement. <laughs> um, she didn't seek this. Huh. There are some who do. Yeah. Um, it was thrust upon her, uh, you know, because she did it because it was the right thing to do. It was thrust upon her because we started making films about her. Right. And, you know, started to, we meaning me and, and, and Stanley Nelson and, and such, um, that it was a voice that was needed. Mm -hmm. And and she she does this now because she has friends who can't because they've right. they, either they were killed or have passed away or just don't have that capacity and she you know she understands that that you know that the message you know there's there's a, there is a place for the freedom writers and so forth to continue to talk we we need the the wisdom of our elders um, mm -hmm. now more than ever um, yeah and but that's she she's more than content for no one to know who she is. Wow. Because that's not why she did it. She didn't do it so everyone could look at her. You know, you see the marches and everyone's taking pictures, right? And we do yeah. talk about this. LeVon Brown and I talk about this in one of our podcast episodes about social media activism. And it's, it's okay to take a picture and to share, but it's all about why are you taking the picture? And what's the right. what how what what's the point of that picture as well you know you know what I mean like in regards to your framing of your picture everything uh, can be said in that but also why are you sharing this what is your message is it look at me look at me look at me or are you sharing more about what's what's actually going on right you know yeah um, and, mm. and 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 really is it because it's just the, the you know the, the cause of the moment and you want to be a part of that or are you really putting in real work beyond yeah. just showing up for the photo opportunity because you're, you know, feeling the energy of it all. Right. But for you, which is beautiful is, uh, you know, with your kids, it's, 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 you're there because this is about your kids. You're not there because it's for you. Right. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. It, it is an it is an equally it's complex you know, but it is it's it's really complex i'm there for my kids and i'm there because of fear with my kids Both. yeah but you know and again and that, this comes back to this aspect that you know i brought up a little bit earlier um about making it personal and mm -hmm. this is uh it should be personal to all of us yeah. Right. Um, cause I, I don't want to, you know, this is not the, you know, uh, <laughs> there's a sense of multiculturalism or diversity, I guess, you know, in, in using your terms of the, um, forces and counter forces. So diversity is a counter force of, of, uh, monoculturalism, you know, and a lot of people say, you know, this is, a, this is particularly in Utah, well, we're all children of our heavenly father. Right. So now thus diversity. So I checked off that box. See, I love every, I love everybody. Right. Yeah. I love everybody. I was like, Oh, okay. Really? Um, yeah. But it's, you know, it's, it's, it's going beyond, it's going beyond that, of course, where we have to be the, the, the very personal one-on-one -on -one aspect and how, mm -hmm. how we make that change. You know, we're not going to change our society from a, 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 a you know, a, a mandate 
right? No. It's it's each of us taking it upon ourselves to make that change. Yeah. Um, and those relationships. I, I had I had someone reach out and um you know, it's like the realization that they didn't have any black friends really shocked them. Mm -hmm. And it was like, wow. Okay. Uh, And why was that? What was it about them? It was, wow, that's that's a bigger part of the society, but also you. Yes. But um, to have those authentic relationships, you know, you have yours because you have your kids, right? Yeah. Very authentic relationships. Totally different dynamic, of course, because it's kids. But we all need to have those authentic relationships because we because we love people, yeah. Because we believe in humanity, not because you know we want to, not because we we don't want to be racist. Just quit making it about yourself, right? Right. I yeah. mean, right now, I think there's a there's a there's an element of I don't want I don't want to be racist. Okay, why? Because you don't want people to see you as as a racist or is it because you actually believe in people and, you know, in equality and so forth? Being an anti-racist does not mean, you know, you get to put a badge on and everyone can look at you and go, oh, okay, he's a, he's a safe one. Okay. Well, he's, he's a good guy. Okay. So let me throw something out. Racism is an addiction. Mm. It's an addiction because it allows us to feel good about ourselves. It, racism allows us to see, stay centered on ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so becoming an anti-racist is almost like going through a 12 step program to acknowledge the racism. Yeah. And so I have to deliberately, so it's, I will always be racist. I mean, think about everything I've said today and think about the love that I've expressed about my kids. And I've publicly put myself out there. I've written about them, everything else. Mm -hmm. Gosh, the internal checks I have to do every day, every day the little racist thoughts that come through. I mean, I've done the work, but man, it's easy. And so to really be an anti-racist, if I am not conscious about my racism, then my racism leads. And that's with two kids who I love dearly. Mm -hmm. That's staking my reputation on my work around, you know, learning about whiteness and privilege and, institutionalized racism and all the rest and being willing to speak out to it. And yet my racist tendencies will lead me every day. But that is a part of living in America. The difference, because I've gone through that as well, and I continue to go through that, uh, is, and my mom goes through that, is that the difference is, is that we actually real recognize it. And that's coming back to recognizing that privilege as well. Mm -hmm. The white privilege that we all have, we're just actually willing to admit it and to go, okay, what's that source? Why did that come to mind? How do I work through that? And it's a conscious awareness of that. It's taking the subconscious and bringing it forward and going, okay, now I'm going to deal with it. I'm actually going to be real about this and to do that. And that's Mm -hmm. what we, that's what we all need to do and, and to recognize our privilege I mean, th- think about it this way. Why does a football team or a basketball team put their starting lineup out at the first play? Right. Every time. Mm-hmm. That's, the, that's where they have their most power. Right. You lead with your power. Right. So white power presents itself at the front of the line with every societal issue that we have. Because it's the most powerful power out there. White privilege is our nation's starting lineup. And it's really hard to give up your starting lineup, even if the team is fully dysfunctional. Mm. Man, we could keep on talking, Curtis. I know that we have to go talk some more sometime. But man, I truly appreciate this this opportunity to talk with you about that. I mean, I've always, uh, you know, you've always had a really good way of just, you know, you know, bringing it into perspective and the clarity and and and, and so forth. And uh, you know, I, I encourage everyone to. Uh, to watch Black White and Us, read courageous conversations about race. It just gives you a greater, greater sense of of, of the work that you've done and well, uh, you. continue to do. Well, so I'll admit this now. 
between you and I, Loki. All right. You're doing what I always dreamed of doing. So keep it up. Oh, I you. always, I always thought I'd be the one out there making the documentaries and the podcasts and, and, and being, being that person willing to, to use their skills in media to capture the right story and the right voice at the right time, but you're actually doing it. So no. I really, I really honor you for that. Well, thank you. Thank you much. I guess now we're patting each other on the back here. I mean, you know, congratulations. <laughs> they, no, one, what I'm saying <laughs> is you deserve <laughs> patted on the back because you do a lot more of this work than I do. Well, from white, from one white guy to another. Thank you. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but this was a discussion of whiteness. Right. You know, and if white people do not look at their own whiteness, man, right. the work will never move forward. Yeah. I, I, I think about the different ways that I engage in, and if I did not continue to do this work around whiteness, it's like serving food without salt. It's just not right. You know, salt, salt brings out the flavors that are there, you know, but understanding whiteness, understanding my own privilege allows me to better function within this work. I, mean, I, I just think, you know, going back to the idea of being in, being at a protest, my white privilege compels me to want to say something. Yeah. And, and if I had not spent a whole lot of years of really trying to analyze this and trying to get really decentered, you know, around my kids and whatnot, man, I'd be the ugly white guy showing up. I may say all the right things, but but I'd be disrupting the protest rather than supporting it. Right. But yeah, you know, it's, and it's, it's, it's tough work and there's no popularity in this. No, you oh know? gosh, no. And it, it, yeah. But, but, but going back to that as well, it's just, 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 you know, um, even saying nothing says everything. Right. And, you know, particularly when it comes to white privilege and it's like, well, I'm not, I might, you know, I might believe in everything, and I might, you know, and I might not, you know, say a whole bunch of racist stuff, right? But yeah. when you say nothing, that ends up saying everything, right? A lot of the times, and so we, so we have to be willing to speak out and, and uh, you know, against our own privilege. Yeah, I mean, this is go, go, going back to your mother. You know, your mother is most well known for being the woman in the photo at the launch camp, right? The mugshot and the yeah okay yeah and the lunch yeah I think the mugshot's taken over that photo but yeah <laughs> thanks thanks to you actually but yes right. so so it's like it's like so that's the big dramatic moment that's the story mm -hmm. but did your mother enact real change at that moment or when she was lonely going door to door knocking on people's doors trying to register them to vote right. That's the hard work, but that's where the real impact came. Right. You know, the work is different than the media story. Yeah. They both have to be there. You know, we, we don't move forward with equality without a big media story surrounding it. But the real work, you know, it's so, so Lex Scott, who heads Black Lives Matter Utah. Yeah, yeah. Person I, I just have immense respect for. Yeah. Um, I asked her today, I'm like, you know, are you attending one of the protests today? You know, is, is there a group I should follow? And her response was, people are treating protests like concerts. They're picking and choosing, being able to tell people which of the famous ones they went to. <laughs> that is <laughs> so fascinating. I mean, yeah. so well said, right? Because yeah. the real work is not the protest. The protest is the media story that hopefully allows the real work to take place. Right. But... On an individual level, the real work um, for white people, in particular, is not again is, is not being silent. So when something is said, you're willing to turn around and go, "Hey, you know what? I found that offensive. Here's why," right. or "You know what? I don't think that's appropriate," or you know, whatever it might be. And whether that's amongst our coworkers, our friends, or our family, um, you know, there's always a wrong time to be right as well. Um, yeah, but uh, we we have to be willing to stand up because a, a lot of people are just waiting for other people to say something. Uh, most people know when something's offensive or inappropriate, right. but most people won't say anything. 
And then when you say something, uh, that's where the change really happens. And uh, and again, the, the honest truth is, is a lot of people just don't know they're saying something offensive. Now, some people do, and they know what they're doing. But for the most part, m- most people have no idea what they're saying. And when we call them on it, they're like, oh, well, I didn't realize that. Right. See, and, and, and the challenge within whiteness is that those moments of call outs are acute pain rather than chronic pain. Right. You know, and so it's it's acute because it's unique to that moment, so it feels incredibly uncomfortable. Rather than living with that uncomfortableness, you know, in perpetuity, which is really chronic. You know, and so chronic pain, someone feels it and it never goes away. Acute right. is, oh, I feel different than a moment ago, but I'll likely feel different a moment from now. Right. And so calling out something, you know, when something wrong is said is an acute moment of pain. Mm-hmm. But as a person with white privilege, it sure isn't chronic. And so am I willing to go through that quick moment of disruption, of uncomfortability, in order to hopefully fight a real chronic issue? Right. Mm. And, it, and, it, and it takes some getting used to. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like the first time you hit your finger with a hammer really hurts. Doesn't mean the hurt is less when you do it again and then again. Mm-hmm. But you're a little bit you'll you're a little bit better at managing the pain, right? Right. And so speaking out is really hard up front, and you lose friends, and you lose contacts, and you know, and and you lose certain elements of respect that you kind of took for granted. Mm-hmm. But it just goes back to this idea of decentering. You become more decentered from your own self interest within it all, and more authentic within making the world the place we hope it will become. It's worth the pain. It's worth the disruption. That much I'm sure of. Thank you again for listening. Make sure you head to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash Loki Mulholland. Show a little love if you can and get access to even more content. Until next time, don't be afraid to get uncomfortable.